This is Physics 2120, Lecture 27. Today we're going to continue talking about image formation and discuss thin lenses. So before we begin thin lenses, we have to talk about how images form due to refraction. Let's look at two transparent media that have an indice of refraction, N1 and N2. And the boundary between the two media is a spherical surface, radius r. And the rays are going to originate from some object, O, in the medium, N1. And we're going to consider paraxial rays leaving the object. And all such rays are refracted at the spherical surface and focus at this image, I. And the relationship between the object and images are given by n1 over p plus n2 over q is equal to the difference of them over r. The side of the surface in which the light rays originate is decide, defined as the front side, and the other is called the back side. Real images are formed by refraction in the back of the surface. So because of this, the sign conventions for Q and R for refracting surfaces are opposite those for reflecting surfaces we talked about in the last lecture. So for refracting surfaces, P is positive when the object is in front of the surface, it's a real object, or negative when the object is in back of the surface, it's a virtual object. The image location Q is now going to be positive when the image is in back of the surface, so on the opposite side. And that'll be a real image. And it's negative if it's a virtual image, if it was in front of the surface. The image height is going to be upright when it's positive, negative when inverted. And the radius is positive if the center of curvature is in back of the surface. It'll be positive or negative if it's in front of the surface. Now what if the radius goes to infinity? What if it's a flat refracting surface? And then if we solve our equation, we get Q is minus N2 over N1 times P. So the image formed by a flat refracting surface is on the same side as the object, and it's a virtual image. So here's the object. As the light rays come out, they're refracted out and what it, it appears then is the light rays appear to come from a point which we call a virtual image. So that means that if I look at things underwater, their location is actually different than what I see. So for example, let's say I have a small fish and it's swimming at some depth d below the surface of a pond. What's the apparent depth of the fish when I look at it from directly overhead? So this is a flat surface, so r is equal to infinity. We plug that into our equation, and we end up with what we said before, q is minus n2 over n1 times p. We plug in our values. So plugging in our values for q is equal to minus 1 over 1.33, or is negative 0.75d. So in other words, when we look at the fish, it looks closer than it actually is. And so oftentimes when we grab for something underwater, as we grab, we grab at something and we miss because it appears about 75% closer than it actually is. So now that we understand image formation, we can start talking about lenses. And they're used to form images by refraction. And they're used in lots of optical instruments like cameras or telescopes or microscopes or eyeglasses. So, light passes through the lens and it experiences refraction at two surfaces. The image formed by one refracting surface acts as the object for the second surface. So if I were to actually look at light going through a lens, I'm incident at some angle to a normal on this, so I'm refracted, and then as I come through, I'm refracted again. So, a lens has an index of refraction n and two spherical surfaces, radius 1 and 2. Radius 1 is the radius of curvature of the lens surface that the light of the object reaches first. And R2 is the radius of curvature of the other surface. 
the object is placed at point O at a distance P1 in front of the first surface. So then there is an image formed by surface 1. And since the lens is surrounded by air, N1 is equal to 1, and we end up with 1 over P1 plus N over Q1 is equal to N1, N minus 1 over R. So if the image due to surface 1 is virtual, Q1 is negative, and it's positive if the image is real. For surface 2, in this case, N1 is equal to N, and N2 is equal to 1. So the light rays approaching surface 2 are in the lens and are refracted into the air. So P2 is the object distance for surface 2, and Q2 is the image distance. And if we plug these in to our equation, N over P2 plus 1 over Q2 is now 1 minus N over R2. If a virtual image is formed at that surface 1, then P2 is minus Q1 plus the thickness. If a real image is formed from surface 1, then P2 is minus Q1 plus the thickness, where in this case Q1 is positive, where before it was negative. If I combine these two things, then I get that 1 over P1 plus 1 over Q2 is equal to N minus 1 times 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2. This is called the lens maker equation. So a thin lens is one whose thickness is small compared to the radius of curvature. And so a thin lens, the thickness, T, of the lens is neglected. And if that's the case, then P2 is equal to minus Q1 for either type of image. And then the subscripts P1 and Q2 can be omitted. And we're going to define the focal length of a thin lens as the image distance that corresponds to an infinite object distance, which then makes it the same as a mirror. So the lens maker equation states 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to N minus 1 times 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2, and we call this whole quantity 1 over the focal length. Then the thin lens equation says the relationship amongst focal length, object distance, and image distance is exactly the same as we have for a mirror. Now because light can travel in either direction through a lens, each lens is going to have two focal points. One focal point is for light passing in one direction through the lens and one is for it going the other direction. However, there is only one focal length. Each focal point is located the same distance from the lens, just on opposite sides. So for example, for a converging lens, if I have parallel light rays come and strike the lens, they're going to focus down to some point. The focal length is the distance from the middle of the lens to where those all converge. In this case, if we look over here, I have a focal length, and the middle of the lens is at 15. Uh, these cross at 20, so the focal length would have been 5 centimeters. Now, if light were to come through the other direction, I'm going to get light focusing down over here, and the length between the middle of the lens and the focal point is the same for the light going in the two different directions. For a diverging lens, I also have two focal points. In this case, as parallel light rays come, they all diverge away, but they appear to come from the focal point. And exactly the opposite thing happens on the light going through the other way. So the focal point is the point where the rays appear to have originated. So in this case, this focal point might be way over on the side. We couldn't measure it, it given this picture, but you can see how they appear to come from some point over on this side. So, to determine signs for thin lenses, the front side of the thin lens is the side of the incident light. The back side is where the light is refracted into. It's also valid for a refracting surface. So, P is positive in front of the lens. Q is negative if it's in front of the lens. P is negative if it's in back of the lens, and Q is positive if it's in back of the lens. So if we look at our sign conventions for thin lenses, they're going to be the same as the sign conventions for a refracting surface. The only difference is 
we need to consider R1 and R2. R1 and R2 are positive if the center of curvature is in back of the lens. They're negative if the center of curvature is in front of the lens. And the focal length is positive, then we have a converging lens. If it's negative, we always have a diverging lens. The lateral magnification of an image through a thin lens is the same as we had for mirrors. It's h prime over h, or minus q over p. So when m is positive, the image is upright and on the same side of the lens as the object. When m is negative, it's inverted and on the side of the lens opposite of the object. Now I can have lots of different shapes for thin lenses. All of these are examples of a converging lens. So I can have biconvex, where I have a convex shape on both sides of it. I can have a convex concave or a plano convex. The convex concave, the radius on this side is larger than the radius on the outside. And plano convex just means one side of it is flat. All of these, the light going through them, are going to converge. Now, these are examples of diverging lenses. They all have negative focal lengths, and they're all going to be thickest at the edges. So biconcave, or a convex concave, or this case, the um, this is the smaller radius of curvature, so I'm thicker out at the edges, or the plano convex, where I have, again, a flat surface and a concave surface. Now, we can also look at ray diagrams for thin lenses. And first, we're going to look at converging lenses. They are convenient for locating images formed by thin lenses or for systems of thin lenses. For a converging lens, we have the following three rays. Ray 1 is drawn parallel to the principal axis, then passes through the focal point on the back side of the lens. Ray 2 is drawn through the center of the lens and continues straight in a straight line. Ray 3 is drawn through the focal point on the front of the lens, or as, as if it was coming from the focal point if our p is less than our focal length, and emerges from the lens parallel to the principal axis. So again, for this one, we see P1 is drawn parallel to the principal axis and then through the focal point. Ray 2 is drawn through the center of the lens and continues in a straight line. Ray th 3 is drawn through the focal point and then parallel to the axis, and we form an image. In this case, the image is real, because it could be projected on a screen. It's inverted it's on the back side of the lens. So if my object is inside my focal length, I'll do something similar. Again, ray 1 goes parallel to the optical axis and through the focal point on the other side. Ray 2 goes through the center of curvature, or through the center of lens and continues straight back. Ray 3 in this case, can't go through the focal point, but it appears to come from the focal point and then parallel to the optical axis. So in this case, the image is virtual, because these rays don't actually cross at some point. They just appear to have crossed at some point. The image is upright. It's larger than the object. And the image is on the front side of the lens. So in this case, someone looking from this side is going to see a magnified object. This is the idea of a magnifying glass. I put the object inside the focal length and it appears bigger. For diverging lenses we have different rays. Ray 1 is drawn parallel to the principal axis and emerges directed away from the focal point on the front side of the lens. Ray 2 is gone through the center of the lens and continues in a straight line. Ray 3 is drawn in the direction toward the focal point on the back side of the lens and emerges parallel to the principal axis. So we can see in this problem then, ray 1, again, is parallel to the axis and then appears to come away from the focal point. Ray 2 is drawn through the center and continues on in a straight line. Ray 3 is drawn toward the focal point on this side, but then comes out parallel to the optical axis. And if I looked at these three diverging rays, and they appear to come from this point 
here. So the image is virtual, the image is upright, the image is smaller, and it's on the front side of the lens. So for a converging lens, when the object distance is greater than the focal length, the image is going to be real and inverted. For a converging lens, when the object is in between the focal point and the lens, the image is virtual and upright. And for a diverging lens, the image is always virtual and upright, regardless of where the object is placed. Now lenses can get very large and very heavy. But Fresnel came up with a lens design that was able to shrink the size of a lens because refraction only occurs at the surfaces of the lenses. And a Fresnel lens is designed so that you get a powerful lensing effect without a great thickness and therefore without a great weight. Very large lenses are hard to make, but these might be much easier to make. So since the surface curvature is the important part of the refracting lens, I can have all that material in the middle of the lens removed. There's lots of examples of Fresnel lenses. This is a, um, the top picture shows a lighthouse um, where I needed to focus the light out in a beam that was, so all the light goes along the surface of the earth so that ships could see it from very far away. Didn't matter how thick these lenses were, only what the shape was. This is a diverging lens. Or we can make a Fresnel lens out of plastic that's really small and thin. You can have a magnifying glass that's essentially a very thin piece of plastic. So let's work a couple of problems with the converging lens. Converging lens has a focal length of 10 centimeters. It forms images of objects that are placed at 30 centimeters, 10 centimeters, and 5 centimeters from the lens. For each case, I want to construct a ray diagram, find the image distance, and describe the image. So, to cor correctly do a ray diagram, we're going to use some graph paper that will help simplify this. So the first thing we do is we're going to draw our lens. And our lens, then we have our optical axis through the center of the lens, and we said we have a focal point of 10 centimeters. So each block on here is going to be 2 centimeters. So we're going to go 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. We have a focal point on either side of the lens. So for the first one, we're going to put our object at 30 centimeters. In this case, it'll be uh, 6 centimeters high. So we draw our first ray. First ray is drawn parallel to the principal axis then passes through the focal point on the back side of the lens. Ray 2 is drawn through the center of the lens and continues in a straight line. Ray 3 is drawn through the focal point on the front of the lens and emerges parallel to the principal axis. And we can see that all these lines cross or converge at this point. And so looking at that then, um, we can figure out exactly Q. Q is, see, this is 10 centimeters, 11, 12, 13, 14 and a half, so 15 centimeters. And it looks like the height is actually going to be about half the height. So Q is about 15 centimeters. The magnification is minus 0.5. The minus means it's inverted. And we could actually apply the lens equation, 1 over p plus 1 over q equals 1 over f, and solve exactly for q, and sure enough, we got 15 centimeters, and the magnification is minus q over p, which is minus 0.5. So for part two, we put our object right at the focal length of the lens. There's no way to draw it from here through this point and in making it through the lens, whatever. It becomes difficult to do any of the um, steps that are required. In fact, if we go ahead and look at our lens equation, we get that Q, 1 over Q has to be 0, or Q is equal to infinity. No image is formed when the object is placed at the focal length of the lens. So for part 3, we're going to have our object 5 centimeters from the lens. In this case, I'm going to let my object be 4 centimeters high. And so ray 1 is drawn parallel to the optical axis and then through the focal point on the back side of the lens. 
Ray 2 is drawn through the lens and continues in a straight line. Ray 3 is drawn as if coming from the focal point to the lens and then is drawn parallel to the optical axis after that. And we look at where these three cross. And they cross over in this area right here. And so it looks like Q is approximately minus 10. It's negative because it's on the same side as the object. And it looks like it's twice as high, so the magnification is equal to 2. And sure enough, if we plug it into our um, lens equation, we solve for Q is minus 10 centimeters. Magnification is minus Q over P. So the magnification is going to be 2. So this is acting like a magnifying glass again. It's, it's making the object appear twice as large and a little further away from our eyes so we can focus on it easier. Now I can have combinations of thin lenses. And if I'm looking through a combination of lenses, the image formed by the first lens is used as the object for the second lens. So I can form the object through the first lens as if uh, the uh, image, or as if the second lens weren't even there, but then I use that image as the object for the second lens. The image formed by the second lens is the final image of the system. So in this case, I have my object, and from my object, I figure out where the image is, and that image is what I use for the object for the second lens, and in this case, it turned out to be I2, is what you would actually see looking through the lenses. So if the image formed by the first lens lies on the back side of the second lens, then the image is treated as a virtual object for the second lens. P is just negative. And we can extend the same procedure through a system of three, four, or five lenses. And the overall magnification is going to be the product of the magnification on each separate lens. Now what if I have two lenses that are in contact with each other? And those lenses have focal lengths f1 and f2. For the first lens, then, 1 over p plus 1 over q1 is equal to 1 over f1. And since the lenses are in contact, P2 is equal to minus Q1. So for the second lens, 1 over P2 plus 1 over Q2 is equal to 1 over F2, which is the same as saying 1 over minus 1 over Q1 plus 1 over Q. And if I combine those two equations, I see that 1 over the focal length of the combination is equal to 1 over the first lens's focal length plus 1 over the second lens's focal length. So two thin lenses in contact with each other are equivalent to a single thin lens having a focal length given by this above equation. Let's work a problem. Two thin converging lenses of focal lengths 10 and 20 centimeters are separated by 20 centimeters. An object is placed 30 centimeters in front of lens 1. Find the position of the final image, describe it, and determine the magnification. So first, 1 over P1 plus 1 over Q1 is equal to 1 over F1. That gives Q1 is equal to 15 centimeters. It's positive, so Q1 is going to be over in this area right here. So that means Q1 is 15 centimeters, and that means P2 is 5 centimeters, since it, this object is 5 centimeters in front of the second lens. So I use that, and I get the magnification of the first lens is negative 0.5 meters. So now I look at the lens equation for the second lens, 1 over P2 plus 1 over Q2 is equal to 1 over F. I solve for Q2 is minus 6.67 centimeters. So magnification 2 is minus Q2 over P2, which is plus 1.33. So the overall magnification is the product of those two, and the overall magnification is minus 0.667. So looking at it, the image is going to be virtual. It's going to be inverted and smaller. Now, there are some lens aberrations that we need to
consider. And we've made some assumptions that rays always made small angles with the principal axis and the lenses are thin. The rays from a point object do not focus at a single point. That causes a blurred image. And departure of actual images from ideal predicted by a model are called aberrations. Spherical aberration results from the focal points of light rays far from the principal axis being different than the focal points passing near the axis. So for a camera, a small aperture allows a greater percentage of the rays to be paraxial. For a mirror, parabolic shapes are used to correct for spherical aberration. We also remember that different wavelengths of light are refracted by a lens at different points. Violet rays are bent more than red rays. So the focal point for red light is slightly greater than the focal length of the violet light. And chromatic aberration can be minimized by using a combination of converging and diverging lenses made of different materials. So to review what we talked about today, we looked at images formed by refraction. Specifically, we looked at different types of lenses, converging and diverging lenses. We looked at the lens equation. 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F. And we talked about combinations of lenses. 1 over F1 plus 1 over F2 is equal to 1 over F.